Connect the Bay is made possible in part by the North Bay Leadership Council and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the premiere of Connect the Bay from Northern California Public Media. I'm your host, Steve Mencher. Our subject today is housing, and it gives us the chance to misquote the immortal New York Yankee catcher Yogi Berra. When it comes to housing in the Bay Area, he might have said, our region is so crowded that nobody can afford to live here anymore. Here's a cartoon we liked from the past week or so. Everybody's leaving the Bay because of troubles with transportation, housing, politics, homelessness. And here's the headline that went along with that cartoon in the San Jose Mercury News. Is the Bay Area pushing people to the breaking point? Then there was this. Bay Area voters, yes, we'll pay to fix traffic, but middling support for housing plan. More about that housing plan in a moment. But we're looking for your questions and concerns, and here's Darren Lachelle from our social media desk to tell you how to be in touch. Hi, thanks, Steve. You can get in touch with us now via email at connectthebay at norcalpublicmedia.org. Also, you can call us right now at our toll-free number, 1-800-287-2722, and find us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at NorCal Public Media. Now, we have a few questions that have come in that I want to go over for you. One is, since the 1990s, multi-story residential building has taken place on every available lot in the South Bay. Yet this has not lowered prices, so why would adopting the same strategy everywhere be different? And that's from Kat Johnson from Facebook. Also, we have um, Maritza Hernandez who says, what options do undocumented individuals have for affordable housing, and how can we produce more affordable housing options for undocumented individuals and people of color? And Steve, finally, we have a question. How can we find affordable housing in Sonoma County? All of the housing here is too expensive. And that's from Annabelle Garcia from a Low CN community event that we partnered on. So some really good questions coming in, Steve, and hopefully more to come. Thanks, and we hope to get some of these answered. But we're going to start by digging into that housing plan that Bay Area residents were asked about. It's called the CASA Compact. And CASA is not an acronym. It stands for the Committee to House the Bay Area. It's a group convened by the MTC and ABAG, and for those of you who aren't regional planning nerds, that's the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Association of Bay Area Governments. And we're joined by David Rabbit. He's the current president of ABAG, and he's also chair of the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. David, can you tell us a little bit about the background of the CASA Compact, why it was written, and what kind of a document is it? Yeah, CASA really started, <clears throat> excuse me, CASA started in about 2008. Um, 2008, the State uh, Sustain Sustainable Community Strategies Plan uh, came out where we were supposed to make sure that our housing, land use, and transportation co coincided with our greenhouse gas reduction goals. In the Bay Area, we cannot make that happen. CASA was actually identified within that first Plan Bay Area plan that was from uh, 2013 as a way to look at housing saying that the status quo doesn't work, we need to do something different. All right, now if the status quo doesn't work, what are some of the ideas that you came up with in terms of this CASA compact? I think the greatest thing about CASA was getting everyone in the same room. People who, who, uh, who, really, <clears throat> excuse me, who really blamed one another uh, for the uh, impasse at housing in the Bay Area. You know, the Bay Area has housing costs that are two and a half times the national average. There are rent burdened people in every county, everywhere. There are people commuting long distances to their jobs. Uh, we just have a very expensive system that's not getting any better, it's only getting worse. So getting those people in the same room to actually come up with a consensus document where no one was really satisfied with the, the outcome of every element, but they were happy to say that they could agree to the, uh, to the piece as a whole and send it off to Sacramento and see if Sacramento can make leg legislation that would uh, change the status quo. All right. Now, David, the Mercury News headline about middling support for CASA missed what I think was the real headline of the story. We have a poll, and it said 53% of homeowners opposed the plan, 32% supported it. But for renters, those numbers were flipped. 62% were in favor, 25% opposed. And another number we were interested in was that the younger people, 18 to 39, they were for it. But as people got older, they were against it. So let's talk about those first three points of CASA, which are the first three points about renters. One of them was just cause eviction policy, emergency rent cap, and emergency rent assistance and access to legal counsel. 
those are for renters, right? Those are for renters. So what CASA really followed three Ps, and it's protection, those three elements right there, mm -hmm. preservation of the existing housing stock that we have that's affordable, and then production. Okay, that's fabulous. Now, we're going to see in just a few minutes, we're going to see a video about renting here in Sonoma County and something I know that you're very concerned with. And there's also Derek Amerens will be joining us and Randy Tsuda of Palo Alto Housing, later John DeLoso of Katati. So here is a video that we'd like to show about what it means to rent in Sonoma County. I'm Adia White, reporting for Northern California Public Media. Santa Rosa currently has a less than 3% rental vacancy rate. Those that have housing are often unwilling to jeopardize it, even if this means renting a unit that is unsafe. Nonprofit Sonoma County Legal Aid Society offers free legal assistance. The tenants here have called legal aid to come and investigate some serious habitability issues in this house. At the moment, there is no gas supply, which means that there's no hot running water and there is no stove or ability to cook food. In addition, there are many holes in the wall, the ceilings, and in the floor, which allow rats and cockroaches to enter. Hace como sí, aproximadamente un año que uno me mordió. <laughs> sí. Um, a mi hermana también la mordió del pie, le mordió un dedo. A mí lo que fue la mejilla. A local neighborhood group, Roseland Community Building Initiative, decided to confront this issue. Many of the members have personally experienced the difficulty of wrestling with their landlord over repairs while also trying to keep their housing. Tengo 11 años viviendo en Santa Rosa y me ha tocado eh, rentar en una, unos departamentos. Ya tenía cuatro años rentando. En el tiempo de octubre, noviembre, diciembre, enero, hay mucho mojo en el techo, en las paredes, por humedad que tienen las casas. Y es cuando pedimos que nos limpien o que nos cambien cosas que necesitan hacer los dueños de los departamentos. Y es, a veces es muy, muy drástico porque todo eso enferme, te produce enfermedades. El moho te produce enfermedades tanto a ti como a los niños. Garcia asked her landlord for repairs. In the meantime, she got a notice that her rent was going up. After that, she got an eviction notice. Es una experiencia común cuando no pagas aumento y pides arreglos, lo que pasa es desalojo. Es algo que está muy a la orden del día. Todos están trabajando en eso. Garcia was able to resolve her issue. Now, she and other members from CBI are drafting a renter protection ordinance with help from leaders from Sonoma County's Community Action Partnership. Their ordinance would make rental housing inspections mandatory in the city of Santa Rosa and put more code enforcement officers on the street. People are really afraid to report. They're afraid of those landlords who might um, evict them or, ha or raise their rent, and so they tend to just kind of live you know, um, they either report and then get evicted, or they, um, they end up um, living with what, in whatever poor conditions there are. CBI held a fundraiser earlier this month to raise awareness about their efforts and support future projects. We have been doing a lot of cleaning in the area of Roseland. We have talked to the community. We have seen the police that is still working in the area of Roseland. We see a little change. As the housing shortage across the Bay Area becomes more dire, this is a model community members may have to take on in order to see a change. All right, we are now joined by Derek Amerens, Executive Director of Working Partnerships USA, which brings together unions, the faith community, and the people in and around Silicon Valley to solve problems like housing. And also Randy Tsuda is joining us via Skype. He's former Community Development Director of Mountain View and Executive Director of Palo Alto Housing, which builds affordable housing. Darren, tell our viewers what they can do if they want to ask questions for Derricka or Randy. You can connect with us by emailing us at connectthebay at norcalpublicmedia.org. Also, you can call us at our toll-free 1-800 number, which is 1-800-287-2722, and connect with us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at NorCal Public Media. A couple of questions here, Steve. One is, 
What is being done to get managers or owners to rent out places without cockroaches, without rats, humidity problems, mm -hmm. so that renters don't get sick? And that's from Noemi Palomino Andrade. Um, also, a second question we have, how can we prevent gentrification in the Roseland neighborhood of Santa Rosa, and that's from Salvador Sanchez <coughs> Strawbridge. And he gave us that question through a community event we did with Lo Cien. Thanks so much, Darren. And Randy, uh, let me give that question to you about gentrification. I know in terms of Palo Alto housing, the place where you're working down uh, in and around Palo Alto, that gentrification is an issue and that folks who have lived there their entire lives are being forced out of the South Bay. Tell us what your organization is doing to, to fight gentrification. Well, as an independent nonprofit entity, we are focused on building affordable housing in the right locations along corridor transit corridors whereby uh, we can strategically build new affordable housing opportunities in locations where our residents have access to transit. Uh, and we're working closely with the communities in which we're currently developing, like Mountain View, Palo Alto, and Redwood City, in, in helping them and advising them on ways and policies to put into place that can help minimize and avoid the risk of displacement. This, of course, is one of the key strategies that's, uh, uh, that is involved in the CASA Compact also, um, is, is in terms of creating policies that will minimize the uh, risk of displacement. All right, uh, Derica. now I know that you work, as you say, with unions, the faith community, and others in your community. And I know that gentrification must be very high on, on the list of everybody there, especially the gentrification that would push working people out of their homes as these uh, tech millionaires that everybody loves to, to pit, play the villains mm -hmm. uh, get their real estate. So what is your organization doing down there? That's a great question. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, we believe that there are a couple of important solutions to this problem. The first is just about power. Low-wage workers, people of color, tenants in our economy and in this region don't have the power and the means to affect solutions. And so we are about organizing folks and bringing them together with politicians and elected officials to ensure their voice is heard. Um, and I don't think it's an easy solution. It's not like there's one magic bullet that if we just do that, it will solve the problem. It really is going to have to be struggled over. All right, uh, Randy, you know, I know that there's talk of the consequence of the so-called pottery barn rule attributed <laughs> to Colin Powell. If you break it, you own it. And the tech companies, for the first time in my understanding, are really trying to step up and pour tens and hundreds of million dollars into some of the solutions down in Silicon Valley. Can you tell us about some of that? Well, Steve, Steve, I think you're exactly right. I think for the first time that I can remember, tech companies are really beginning to focus on getting involved in solutions to address housing in general and affordable housing specifically. You know, companies like LinkedIn are really playing a leadership role in convincing other companies to invest money in the so-called tech fund. That's a fund that's being set up by Housing Trust Silicon Valley to provide loans for affordable housing developers and first-time home buyers as a way for these companies to really invest in housing solutions uh, in the greater Silicon Valley area. And LinkedIn's leadership is, is being followed by other companies, prominent companies here in Silicon Valley, like Cisco and Pure Storage, and most recently, NetApp. All right, and don't uh, forget, if you want to call in and ask a question, you can call one 800 287-2722, or email us at connectthebay at norcalpublicmedia.org. Now, uh, number five on this CASA points, the minimum zoning near transit. Mm -hmm. Why is it good for working people that their housing be near transit? Maybe to some that's obvious, but there must be some layers to the answer to that question. Yeah, there are definitely layers <laughs> to that question. I mean, I think it goes without saying that all workers uh, in the economy want to be near transit to be able to get to good jobs. And the reality is many of the best jobs are located in places that are hard, especially for low-wage workers who get pushed out to get to. We also have to remember there's another important layer around Many low-income communities and communities of color along transit lines are very worried that any policy proposals will 
gentrify their neighborhoods and push them further out. So while this is an important compact item, an important policy item, we have to have the tools to bring the voiceless to those decisions um, and, to, and get it right. And I think that's why there's a lot of controversy around this particular proposal. Okay, Randy, before we let you go from down in, in Palo Alto, do you have a, a final word about why you, know, you have worked for municipalities, you've worked for the tech business, why are you spending your time now at Palo Alto Housing building affordable housing? Well, I think we can all agree that the issue of our time right now in the Bay Area is, is housing. And I really felt that uh, if I could find the right opportunity, I really wanted to focus and play a role in building affordable housing and creating change in Silicon Valley. So that's why I've made the transition from uh, the public sector into uh, affordable housing development. Well, thanks for doing that for all the people down there who I know are depending on your answers to these questions. Now, Derricka, there are many potential solutions to the housing crisis as there are problems. And in a moment, we're going to see a story about Habitat for Humanity up here, creating you know, smaller homes, what they call Sonoma cottages, to be one solution. And that connects with point number four of the CASA Compact, which I know is removal of regulatory barriers to accessory dwelling units. Here is uh, that story we're going to have about the creation of those uh, dwelling units. And we'd like you to look at this, and we'll talk afterwards. Great. Sonoma County is facing an acute shortage of affordable housing, making it increasingly difficult for many to continue residing in the North Bay. Mike Johnson, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity in Sonoma County, is surveying the site where Habitat will soon be installing temporary housing for survivors of the October 2017 wildfires. These Sonoma cottages are a pilot program. So these are a couple of the units. There's going to be about eight or ten of them that are about the same size, you know, 450, 550 square feet. Four companies are building distinct Sonoma Cottage prototypes, according to plans by architect Marianne Cusado. This gigacrete cottage employs steel frames and proprietary building materials. Habitat is evaluating the benefits of each prototype for future projects. A unit like this, for example, you can see up around the eaves, there's no wood to catch fire, right? So in a traditional building, that's typically where the fire tends to grab hold is under the eaves. So a building like this is gonna be a lot more fire resistant than a typical build technology would be. Connect Homes provided the second cottage that Mike is surveying today. This is a sort of a typical layout. We're in the living room of this unit at the moment. So when you walk back here, you know, you've got bathrooms and two bedrooms, all right? So this would be the bathroom area, the living room and kitchen would all be uh, in, in the front part. And then you have one small and one master bedroom. So even though it's small and compact, you can get a family of three or four people into this one unit, 550 square feet. As Habitat ramps up its efforts in Sonoma County, the nonprofit is also broadening its focus. Habitat's mission generally is to serve people who are in the 60 to 80 percent of AMI, right, which is area median income or in the low income category. But we also want to look at ways that we can serve people in the moderate income category because they're struggling just as hard to make it in this expensive county as people who are in the lower income categories. And those folks don't have access to a lot of the benefits and services that people in the low income category do. Habitat will construct a prefab factory and warehouse this year. Mike says building smaller, faster, cheaper, higher, and denser will be crucial to expand local home ownership. More rental housing is great, but it's not the same living in a rental as it is living in a home that you own. When you can afford your mortgage, you can save. You can invest in your children's educations. You can invest in your community. You can volunteer. You can do all sorts of things that folks who are struggling to make ends meet can't do. 
A shortage of local construction labor is another building impediment. There's a lot of building going on now, which is a great thing, but what that means is that it's difficult to find people to build. We're about 19,000 skilled workers short to build the 30,000 or so homes that we need to recover. Habitat is partnering with the Santa Rosa Junior College to train students in prefab construction. Santa Rosa Junior College's students will be working side by side with Habitat staff in our prefab factory to learn prefabrication skills. And then those same folks would go on to help build on Habitat work sites. Nancy Miller, the director of the Junior College's Regional Adult Education Program, is leading construction training development. One of the areas of biggest need for workforce preparation prior to the fires in October 2017 was construction trades, including landscaping. We just didn't have enough workers in that area. The JC hopes to increase the number of students it trains in construction-related fields from 150 students a year to 500. Increased wages and full-time employment are two of the goals that we're hoping to accomplish by training people in the construction trades. Our building plan is really over a 10-year period, so we're trying to address long-term employment in construction as well. Nancy and her colleagues are pursuing funding to build a construction training facility on campus. Students will train in the Habitat Prefab Factory until the school's own facilities come online. Having a partner like Habitat provides a realistic opportunity as opposed to building a shed or a bird box or a picnic bench, we're building homes and so there's a realistic process. Finding better, faster ways of doing this kind of work is the only way we're going to build our way out of this situation. Habitat plans to build 600 homes in the next eight years. The idea with prefabbing is that you can build parts of a home ahead of things like foundations and site work, right? So even before you begin grading a site like the one we're on now, you can begin building panels for the houses that will eventually be built on that site. So it really compresses the build times, right? Which saves a lot of money. and allows us to build more houses each year. Habitat remains optimistic about prefab's potential, but challenges remain. Mike says many builders and planning departments are not yet accustomed to prefab building methods, slowing down the widespread adoption of these new technologies. We've been doing things the same basic way for 50 years now. You know, so the technology exists to do things differently. It's, it's changing the way we think that's the hard part. And here's one more visit to Darren Lachelle at the social media desk. Hey, thanks, Steve. We have a question just come in on Instagram. This is a North Bay question from Bay Blue Eyes, who asks, what needs are being met for the disabled and the handicapped that are living on low-income housing in the Sonoma County, Santa Rosa area and under the same stress as everyone else? Um, also, we have a South Bay question. Um, how can we pressure local governments to establish temporary housing solutions such as sanctioned encampments and also safe parking programs? Um, finally, a question. If you could wave a magic wand and enact any regulatory or policy change, what would you do? And that is another um, viewer question from the South Bay. All right. Thanks so much, Darren. I think we're going to give you the magic wand, Derricka, and uh, wave it. So that's a great question. <laughs> um, I'm going to give a, a, so instead of a regulatory policy or a policy change, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to pick one, there isn't one. If I had a magic wand, I would um, make it so that elected officials today have to deal with all three Ps in their policy solutions to set us up for 10 years from now. So produce housing, produce preserve. More, produce more housing at all levels, mm -hmm. preserve affordable housing mm -hmm. for folks, and protect renters in place and families in place. Okay, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce John Deloso. He's the mayor of Katadi. 
which is just five minutes down the freeway from us. Yes, indeed. And some <laughs> of the mayors and elected officials in some of the smaller places around the Bay have some real concerns about the CASA Compact, and, and I would ask you to share some of those with us, John. Well, thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Yeah, you know, um, there's a couple of concerns that jump out to a number of us right away. The first one is the scalability of this CASA Compact. When we look at uh, near transit orientation, there's uh, the ability to go five stories and with bon density bonuses up to seven stories. And that may work in some larger density cities in the Bay Area and will definitely not work, in my opinion, in a small town that has 9,000 people, such as mine, which is Cotati. So scalability is something that I think it can still be looked at and still addressed. There's plenty of time for this. We're not we're not speeding this through in the next few months. I think we need to take our time and make sure what we're doing, we're doing it right. And also the loss of local control. Uh, I have a concern with the loss of local control, the voice of the people. Local government was set up so local people can make these decisions. And here in the North Bay, there was a local decision that was made a long time ago, and that's not to build a nuclear power plant at Bodega Bay. Why are we in such a rush? Well, John, I mean, nuclear power plant and housing for poor and working people, uh, I don't see those as equivalent. Uh, I'm not sure why you brought that in. So I would say they're not equivalent, but they are on the, the level of having local voices. You know, we had a nuclear regulatory agency that was a federal agency that wanted to come in and do this, but it was the local constituents that fought it down. I'm not saying this is to be fought down, but should be discussed. Okay, Derek, let me give you a, a short opportunity to talk to John and mm -hmm. to try to get him on the side of working together, which I'm sure he'd like to be. Yeah, actually, I appreciate John's points. I don't think that, I think we all have to recognize that CASA was a process that happened and is now in a new phase. The promise of CASA, I believe, is that is the, is the coalition of the willing across to the divide of labor, small cities, big cities, developers, coming together to say none of us have the option to not do all three Ps, to not really figure out how we're gonna dig in. And so I think that, that your points are valid and what we have to really say is though, how do we get out of our local um, point of view and work together? Okay, well, thank you both. And that's it for our first edition of Connect the Bay, Solutions to the Housing Crisis. I want to thank Derek Amerens, John Deloso, and Randy Tsuda and David Rabbit, who joined us earlier. Okay. And for all of you who got in touch with us via social media, we're going to put those questions up on our website. And over the course of the next weeks and even months, we're going to really make an opportunity to, to dig into those questions about housing, because we know how much housing is a concern of everybody who's been watching us and listening today. So we thank you so much for joining us on, on Connect the Bay today. And we really appreciate those of you who took the time in public meetings, in social media, on Instagram, Facebook, and all our other, other social media uh, outlets to, to ask your questions, to, to tell us you care, and to uh, make this a part of your Sunday evening. So, so long until June 30th. That's the next time we'll connect the bay.